Welcome to this edition of the Million Dollar Mastermind Podcast. This is where we pick the brains of high achievers from all walks of life and get their hard-earned, real-world insights on winning. I'm your host, Larry Wydell. Well, the thing is that the podcast format is so flexible, you can do it however you want. And uh, I wanted to dig in there and see how you did it, because I know a lot of people There's always more people, always more people considering doing a podcast than are actually doing a podcast. And so they like fresh ideas on how to do it. Because some, you know, I have uh, one of my uh, guests that has uh, like a one minute update he does every day. That's his podcast. One minute on the news and latest news in the world of real estate. You know, here's where's what happened in real estate today. And, you know, he prepares it listening uh, gets it all put together on his way to work. You know, it'll dictate it and everything. And so he's got his one minute. Then, I, you know, then you'll have people that what I do is I'll do these interviews and break them into uh, uh, four, uh, four chunks. Like our interview will be broken into four segments and then roll that out in a week. And so that allows uh have consistent content, but, uh, Uh, It's doable. You know, you can still have a a life, you know, and so (laughs) (laughs) that's important. (laughs) Well, it's important. I I think it's it's like and let's let's talk about this. It's important that you design this in a way where you can keep doing it. Yes. I'd like you to talk about this real quick. The uh, uh, where you are experientially and knowledge wise about. Uh, the industry and how to build a productive company versus where you were, let's just say, even before you started your association. You were very knowledgeable when you started the association, but I'm sure your, you know, your learning has just gone off the charts. And as you've got more and more bigger, bigger, more situations and, and talk about like, and so the thing is what I'm saying to you is you've got to design this thing where you'll keep doing it. Yes. Yeah, you do. You allow yourself to get burned out. You have to build it to scale. And one of the things that you also have to be willing to do is, which is really hard. This is one of the hardest things to do, especially for us. And I mean us here in the United States, because we hold up stick to itiveness and grit as almost a religion. You know, like the old the old coach who said, you know, you know, winners never quit and quitters never win, right? Right. Yeah. And And that whole concept of just stick with it. Well, when you're developing a a business and you're developing a podcast, any program, anything that you're doing, you have to be willing to go down multiple paths as if it was a hypothesis. I hypothesize that this is going to produce value and work. Sometimes things look marvelous on paper, but when you put them actually to work, you're like, this is not quite producing what I thought it was going to produce. Right. At that point, you have to be willing to move on and try something else. If you don't right. do that, right, you end up sticking to something that's just never going to work. So right. I think that that's one of the things that I learned in this whole uh, adventure of building this is the idea of the pivot. You have to keep pivoting. You have to keep pivoting. You think that you know what your audience needs or what your clients need or want, But then you find out that it's maybe a little different than what you thought. You have to pivot. You think that the best way to do a podcast is a particular way. And then later on, you listen to it and you listen to others and you try to figure out, well, what is it I'm trying to achieve? And you realize, no, I need to redo this format, you know, and like your format, you break it down into four. My format is each one of those interviews becomes an episode. But what I do is. In order to make it instructional, after I create the episode, so during the episode, I'm doing what you're doing. I'm asking questions and I'm listening and recording. But then after I do the episode, before I send it away to have them fix the sound and add the music and all that stuff, I listen to it again and I listen to it with a different ear. Now I'm hunting for what are the pearls here? What's the stuff that's actionable that people can do? And then I extract that and then I do a voiceover. And then I record my voiceover where I say, 
here are the 10 things or here are the seven things that I learned from this. One, two, three, I enumerate them. And then I bridge over in the next half, we're going to find out about whatever the next thing is. And then I do the same thing in the next half. And then I close it out with some kind of overlaying comment about, you know, what I got out of this. And by doing that, it takes a conversation and it turns it into a learning experience for the listener. And so, and that's what I was trying to achieve. That's what I was. So that's that's what we ended up well, uh, and I doing. Tell you, that is absolutely priceless to get, you know, to listen to it, pull out the summaries, listen for these things. This is what I got. That's absolutely priceless. And I'm very jealous that you can get yourself to do that because I never could. <laughs> I I go I go into complete withdrawal if I have to listen to myself talk on a recording. Yeah. <laughs> or to That's see a funny. Story like that, it's like oh, no. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's funny. But what I find is that over the years, when you were talking about um, you know, my learning curve. Yeah. Uh you know, my learning curve was moving, especially after I started, you know, doing some of the stuff on my own. I started building this group and building the business. But my learning curve absolutely took off when I started doing the podcast. And there's another program I do that doesn't go into a podcast. This is for the more senior leaders. These are for yeah. the chief diversity officers. Uh-huh. It's called Sharpening the Axe. And there... I get select thought leaders, sometimes CEOs of companies that come in and they basically talk about like some other business aspects that you can leverage a lot of this. And I have to tell you that just being able to listen to a lot of these different people who have deep, deep expertise in so many different areas. A lot of times after the podcast, I go out to Amazon and purchase books because I become curious about this topic and I want to learn more. So literally this has been not only something that's been developing as a business and provided value for the listeners and for the people I serve, it's actually been a tremendous education for me too. Yeah. And uh, it's unavoidable when you do these, these things, if you uh, have the proper guest list that you're uh, you, you become hopelessly behind in the books that you want to read, you know, but uh, you know, but but that's another reason to keep living. You know, I've got to catch, I can't go now. I've got all these books to read. <laughs> that's right. That's right. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. You know, I, I mean, I started, I actually started listening to books on Audible also yeah, because right. I sometimes didn't have the time. I bought the book and it sat there and I'm like, I want to crack that book open or it's on my Kindle. And yeah. maybe if I was going on a long flight, that would be the opportunity to read. Right. So then uh, I started using Audible. And now I just plug into these books. And, you know, after a while I was buying, because when you buy the membership, you get an automatic certain right. amount of credits yeah. automatically, right? Yeah. Well, I would go to buy, get another book and they would say, you're out of credit. So I'd have to buy it, right? And I, I was like, wow, it's like, I need to upgrade my membership or something yeah. because my reading speed, you know, is beyond the credits that I'm getting every month. But it's just that you sometimes believe that a topic is, Like I just interviewed someone on the topic of burnout and a really important topic. And as she was talking about the topic, she started talking about all these other signals that are like the pre-signals of when a person is headed toward burnout. So a lot of times when people say, oh, I've got to do something about this or take a vacation, I'm getting burned out. They're already burnt out. They're already yeah. like on stage yeah. seven, you know? Right. And she was talking about these earlier stages and how your environment and your community affect you. And I found that fascinating. So I went out and got another book. You know, now I'm reading about, about that, right? For those of you who are sick and tired of fooling around and are dead serious about wanting to move up fast, I've got something especially for you. I've combined the best insights from over 40 years in business and making $70 million in income and compress them into a free webinar. That's right. It's a free resource. If you want to find out exactly what the concepts are that I use in coaching million dollar earners, register now at widelonwinning.com. You'll discover the five part framework used by so many to reach their financial, personal and professional goals. You can find that link in this episode's show notes.
Yeah, it's kind of like thirsty. You know, by the time you realize you're thirsty, you've been, you know, you're, you're way dehydrated, you know. Correct. Yeah. That's correct. But uh, uh, as you uh, look at this, uh, the life you've had, when you go in, even now at this point, you can't always expect to make recommendations to people that are going to actually work. Like you said, you have to make, you know, be prepared to pivot or the way to look at that is you're not, uh, you're just improving. You know, basically it's, it's like the iPhone, you know, they come up with the iPhone and they improve it. And so as you look, what are some, uh, early on, I'm sure you probably had these more early on, uh, I can't go without hearing one of these. I'm sure you had one where you went into a place, you paid high dollars to fix something, you got the great reputation, and you made recommendations that just turned into crap. And uh, uh, <laughs> you just can't have an unblemished life. Uh, do you, does one of those uh, come to mind, and what did you do about it? Yeah, no, I mean, I actually, I actually had, I was fortunate and I call it fortunate that I didn't do this on my own dime because yeah. I was actually working for another company when I did it. So I was an employee at the time. But I thought that if we basically just went out and did this training that, you know, it would make changes in the way that people behave and so right. forth. Uh, I don't know what made me do it. I was fortunate that I decided to do a pilot instead of doing a full blown 75,000 people. Yeah. And after I finished, I looked at it and I looked at the results and I was like, people are behaving the same way as they were before. This thing didn't work. <laughs> right. It didn't. And, you know, later on, you know, uh, you know, more reading and more learning later on. It, now, today, there are tons of articles that you can get on the Internet that say that day long trainings or half day trainings do not change human behavior because uh, we all. tend to go back to our habits. Right. So, you know, that was a big lesson. And one of the things that I recommend that people do today when they approach any kind of intervention. So let's say you want to change your behavior in people or yeah. you want to change the way the company works. I always say approach it like you are doing an experiment and you have a hypothesis. And that yeah. hypothesis is that we currently have this condition. We want to be in this other condition. And if we do this intervention, it's going to get us from here to there. So do it with that control group. And measure where you are in the beginning and then measure where you are later on and look at yeah. the two. And if there is no change over a period of time, you know, have the intestinal fortitude to say, this doesn't work. This doesn't Let's find work. something else, right? Yeah. Instead of continuing to double down, there are organizations today that are still doing, uh, let's say they do firm-wide unconscious bias training as a way of changing the way that people think. It doesn't change the way people behave to do a, a four hour or a full day right. training. What changes the way people behave is when they get on a regular basis, some piece of information that again and again reminds them right. until they change a habit. Ben Franklin was doing this years ago on a piece of paper. He wanted to be a better man, made a list of all the different attributes he wanted to have. And on a regular basis, he went back and he checked. Did I do that? Yes or no? And he graded himself. And in his yeah. writings, he even said, I find that when I pay attention to one thing, I tend to slide on the other. Not yeah. in those exact words, but that yeah. was the sentiment. And yeah. he found out, focus on a few things, change that little behavior in that one area, then focus yeah. on something else. And if you can get people to do that over time, their yeah. behavior changes. But the old, let's pay a million dollars and train half of the company uh, in this one thing to change their behavior and do it in one day, there is no evidence that that works. In fact, to the contrary, there's a lot of evidence that it does not. Yeah, and uh, you know, it's gotta be combined in with incentives, competition, accountability, you know, uh, focus on exactly what, you know, things, a lot of thinking from the higher level people or in the management is like exactly what do we want people focusing on and then make sure they understand that number and then uh, have them report in on those things so that, you know, they'll know what, what's supposed to move, you know, what, what the indicator that, you know, so that they know that what you're looking at is what they need to be looking at. Exactly. You can start to see things go up because everybody's looking at the same number. 
Exactly. Someone, and, someone shared a great story with me along those lines about a training like that. What they were doing is they wanted, they were, they were a company that manufactured a product that really depended a lot on shippers, on distributors, independent yeah. distributors. So now these independent distributors were people who, you know, they tended to do what most people do. They favored working with the people they liked best. Right. And so the organization realized, hey, you know what? We need to make sure that we are really in a good relationship with these people that are the people who are going to take our stuff and, you know, logistics people. They're going to move our stuff product, you know, from one place to the other. So they put together a program that was designed to help their team members that interface with these people to become more effective in understanding different people from different backgrounds and so forth and become more effective in creating rapport. It was literally, you could call it a diversity program, literally, but it had a very specific outcome that it was looking for. And so they were able to measure the success of that mini program that they had. And then they had reinforcement for it, of course, but they were able to measure that particular project from the initial training and all the reinforcement and success by looking at the degree of engagement that they had from their logistics uh, suppliers. Ah. So now they were finding, hey, they're favoring us. They're, 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 they're coming in to pick up our stuff and deliver it to our customers. And they're doing it more frequently. They're doing it more effectively. We know this worked because, yeah. it, because as you said, we had a clear idea of what it was that we wanted to change and how to visibly see that change right. when it happened. If it's yeah. just, you know, Larry's going to change the way he feels about this. Well, then, unless I'm a mind reader, you know, and I can feed into your brain and your emotions, right. how do I know that you feel or yeah. think any different than you did before the training? I don't, right? Yeah. Right. Yeah. And, uh, you know, practical lessons that never change. And so as you come up in life, you know, you have to learn them for yourself. But these are lessons. If you were to run that same experiment, that you ran early on in your life, you'd find whatever company you did that with, just train them. You, It's not going to make a difference at all. So, you know, it's kind of a universal lesson. And uh, uh, the sooner, but I think every manager, every, every uh, leader says, what we need is more training, you know, more training. And when we, we I, a quick story, we went independent and financial services and uh, all of a sudden, we're recruiting training development. So I got 10 recruits the first uh, month. And my ma my uh, upline came to me and he said, you're not going to recruit any more people, are you? He said, this, you know, going into the next month, he said, you're gonna, what are you going to do? He said, you're going to train these people, right? I said, oh, yeah, I need to train them. So I stopped recruiting. Well, never stop recruiting. Anyway, I stopped recruiting. And I went, I trained these people, 10 people. Here's the result. In fact, I went up, I found Fred Herman, who designed the Dale Carnegie sales training courses. He wrote them, he ran them, he had retired, he was in Rome, Georgia. I went up there and sat in his backyard with a you know folding chair, and he told me, boom, 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 how you put together a training program. So I said, okay, I got it. I went down, I designed a training program. I did 30 days of, well, four, four weeks of training in the office all day long. At the end of the month, all, well, I'll say I had one person still standing. The other nine had quit. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. I had trained them out of business, you know. <laughs> so the uh, the thing is you can overdo uh, your training. It's got to be combined in with results. You know, the thing that would have worked is if he had made one word in there, field training. You know, you train them in action, you know, where you're actually closing sales and Doing what you're supposed, whatever it is you're supposed to do, you're getting trained doing that, you know. And yeah. little little things you learn, like who holds the pencil. Like if you're training them on filling out a form, you know, <laughs> you want to do it fast. They said, just watch me do it. Boom, 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 boom. They don't learn a thing. But if they hold the pencil, all of a sudden there's a bigger retention, you know. So exactly. Uh, uh, I I'm excited about what you're doing. We need more productivity. We need more winners. We need more successful companies. And that's that's never going to get away from the quality of people they come in and how productive those people are allowed to be. And so you're doing a great service 
and I wish you the best. Thanks so much, Joseph. Do you have any last word that you want to pass on to everybody before we leave? Yeah, well, thank you, Larry, for having me on your on your program. It's been a pleasure talking to you. You you actually made me walk down memory lane a few times. <laughs> some some good memories and some yeah. that were scary for me sometimes, right. but they were good. Uh, but yeah, no, I mean, I think you 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 summed it up very well. I think the important thing is that we are heading into a future that is faster, more competitive, and and certainly more complex than it's ever been before. And in order to be successful in that future, uh, we need to be able to get the best people, support them in their success. That right. supports us in our success. And, uh, and we need to do that now. This is, this is not something I, I say it's like climate change. If yeah. you wait until the ocean is boiling, you need to go to another planet. It's too yeah. late. Yeah. And if you wait until you see all the markets change and all the people changes and and everything, and you start to do this, it'll be too late because by then the competition already has your lunch well in hand. Absolutely. And so uh, wish you the best and let's stay in touch. Thanks much. Absolutely. Thanks, Larry. Thanks for listening to the Million Dollar Mastermind. If you felt there were any valuable takeaways from this episode, please take a minute and leave us a five-star review. Your feedback is important and really helps us get the word out to a wider audience. Remember, we have a valuable webinar that is absolutely free. Register for it right now at whitealamwinning.com. Thanks for listening.